coming. We're really excited to have such a great turnout. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and introduce the speakers tonight and uh, sort of go over uh, the outline of what we'll be doing. So uh, we have uh, Jason and staff to you here, who is an HMS grad, uh, 2003, uh, Canon Society. Uh, then went on to train here in the Harvard Combined Radiation Oncology Program and is now an attending at uh, Mass General Hospital specializing in GU radiation oncology. And he has also been uh, leading uh, this Harvard Botswana uh, oncology partnership over the past couple of years, which he'll talk more about. Um, and then we have Rebecca Clayman, uh, who is a graduate of University of Wisconsin and has also been working with Dr. Kastastu over the last year or so um, doing work on global oncology. And I'm Nina, who I'm a fourth year med student here. Uh, we have uh, the handout with all the text, and then the PowerPoint will have all the images. And what we'd really like for this to be is a discussion. So we'll be throwing out questions uh, throughout the presentation, and then at the end we'll have discussion time to talk about things. But um, we really want you guys to speak up, ask questions. And this is so sort of supposed to be both about global oncology and also about radiation oncology. Um, as a med student, you don't get a lot of exposure uh, to the field, so if anyone's interested in pursuing a career in radiation oncology, have a natural disaster, <laughs> um, feel free to ask, and we'll have Dr. Stockton's email at the end as well uh, if you want to contact them about it. So the agenda for today, we're going to uh, start with some background and then uh, talk about the case that you have in front of you, and then, as I said, we'll uh, leave a lot of time to, uh, for you guys to ask questions and for us to talk about things. So I just want to start off with uh, a few slides that I got from uh, Dr. David Hunter, who's the dean at the Public Health School. Uh, he gave a really great uh, talk on global cancer epidemiology a couple weeks ago. And uh, so this first slide uh, is titled The Projected Number of Cancer Deaths Worldwide. Uh, from now until 2030. And we can see that uh, it's definitely said to increase worldwide. And this line represents uh, the projected cancer deaths in developing countries, and this one in developed countries. So you can see that the burden of increased cancer mortality will mainly be in uh, the developing world. Uh, this next slide uh, is a map that shows the global access to radiotherapy. And it's color-coded. Uh, the colors represent the number of people served by one radiotherapy unit. So you can see in the colors in green, including us, um, and in parts of Asia and South America, uh, one machine serves uh, fewer than half a million people. We can contrast this to these places in Africa, uh, where the countries in red have not a single radiation uh, unit in the entire country. Uh, and other ones that are in yellow and orange have very <coughs> few radiation uh, machines in that country. For example, Botswana, which we'll be talking about, has one radiation machine per uh, one to two million people, which translates to one in the entire country. So Botswana has one in the whole country, while the U.S. has uh, about 3,500. So there's a huge disparity, and if you contrast it to where we're expecting the, ma the majority of cancer deaths to be, you can see that um, there's a huge inequality. And uh, this slide is a table comparing the treatment of HIV uh, and cancer, why, uh, as we'll see, the treatment of cancer is much more difficult um, and requires more comprehensive care. So HIV, which is also uh, a very, it's an epidemic in developing countries, and especially in Botswana, um, to diagnose, you need a blood test, uh, CD4 count, whereas for cancer, you need clinical suspicion, a biopsy, histology, cytology, um, and it also varies according to the type of cancer. So much more complex to diagnose, to even diagnose the disease. Um, HIV, we treat with antiretroviral therapy, whereas cancer, we think of yeah, operating, giving chemotherapy, and radiating. Um, for HIV, we can uh, do a blood test just to monitor the disease, while for cancer, we need more fancy imaging. And then the relapse treatment is, again, much more complicated for uh, cancers. And as is palliation for uh, HIV, we think of more medicines. For cancer, we think of medicines or radiation. And then I think what makes cancer care most challenging in developing countries is uh, 
the different types of clinicians that need to be involved in the care. So we have community health workers, nurses, lab tech surgeons, oncologists, radiation oncologists, and radiologists. And not only do they all need to be present and trained, they all need to communicate with each other, which is um, extremely difficult in places where uh, infrastructure may be lacking. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stockton. Thanks very much, Dina. <clears throat> Thanks so much for organizing this effort. I mean, I think global oncology has really exploded as far as it, in an organizational way within the, the Harvard system, and, and it's uh, credit to Nina and the other folks who've gotten involved in the GO committees for, for really uh, bringing life to these efforts. Um, so we, we uh, you know, and, and it's, is it Neo? That's right, I, I, the physician from Botswana. Citrinia. Citrinia. Yes. And, you're, and you're a physician trained in Botswana who's here now? Or? They trained in Australia, originally from Botswana and currently living in Boston. Oh, great, great. So uh, feel free to chime in. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, we, we chose Botswana for a variety of reasons to work with, primarily because we have a wonderful partnership with um, uh, physicians in the HIV AIDS world, so the infectious disease world, uh, who have been working in Botswana for uh, over 15 years. So it's the Botswana Harvard partnership. And actually, uh, Scott Dryden Peterson, who, uh, who I went to medical school with here, we were at, at HMS together, he has been working and has lived also in Botswana. And that's how this link initially kind of developed. Um, there are a number of other reasons why we chose to focus some efforts in, in the country of Botswana in global oncology is because there is actually a sufficient infrastructure there for specialties like mine, radiation oncology, which requires that. Um, I mean, we, in, a, in a sense, we, we're, we're, we're useless if we don't have some form of radiation machine, and, and very fortunately, Botswana has one of the accelerator. But before I get too much into that, who, who even has heard of, has everybody here heard about radiation oncology? Because I'll be very honest, I did not hear about radiation oncology <coughs> until about June or July of my fourth year here at HMS. And I'm now a radiation oncologist, which is kind of amazing. Uh, but has everybody, everybody here has at least heard of radiation oncology. Is that true? Yeah, there's some first years who didn't, don't feel bad, I didn't know until fourth year. Um, so everybody has heard about that. So I think this is an opportunity to ask questions about what is actually still a rather small field and a very technical one, uh, but one that plays a vital component into comprehensive cancer care. Um, Botswana is a country of roughly 2 million uh, 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 inhabitants, so the population is about 2 million. It has, it's about 70% of it is covered by the Kalahari Desert. So it is actually, for its size, reasonably sparsely populated. The, the capital is Haberoni, they're, they're in the south, neighboring um, uh, South Africa. And so it is in southern Africa, it's landlocked. Uh, the bordering countries are not only South Africa, but Namibia, um, uh, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, as you probably, uh, all of you know, I mean, has had a certain degree of political upheaval. I mean, it's the, the regime of Mugabe and all of this. And in fact, there's been an uh, sort of exodus of some of the highly trained folks from Zimbabwe that historically had a wonderful infrastructure for things like health care. And, and some of these folks are actually in Botswana. And so part of the story is that the, the two um, uh, clinical oncologists that we work with, uh, mostly actually in Botswana, are from originally from Zimbabwe. So it's important to know that it's, it's however, Despite having some reasonably unstable neighbors, Botswana is incredibly stable. It's a democratic country. It has a, a long um, uh, history of, of, of stability and democracy. It used to be a British protectorate, uh, I think gaining independence in 1966 uh, in the country, <coughs> in the healthcare system and in, in, in the education system. And so that goes back to the point that I made earlier, which is there is uh, an infrastructure, and a, a, a reasonably good one to, to work with. Um, what else can I tell you from this? I think that, that's, that's probably, um, uh, probably good. The, 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 the one dramatic thing to understand healthcare in Botswana is the AIDS epidemic. Um, so 
Botswana, I believe, has had probably the second highest HIV AIDS infection rate in the world. Um, and current estimates are that about one quarter, so 25% of the adults um, uh, uh, in Botswana are HIV positive. So this curve, this graph, actually shows a dramatic change in the life expectancy of the population, which was roughly uh, on the order of 60 or 65 years old um, in, the, in the 1990s, dropping in early 2000s to um, uh, age 35, as far as the life expectancy there. It led, and again, please, please uh, help me if I'm getting any of these details wrong, but it led to a dramatic, I mean, in fact, the country thought it might be wiped out by this epidemic. And so a lot of investment uh, went into healthcare and making uh, antiretrovirals free, which happened actually in 2003, where this graph ends. And um, so the government is, is funding a number of foundations, the Gates Foundation is also involved in other groups, what's one of Harvard Partnership and others, are there um, making all of this a reality. But what you have seen over the last 10 years is that they're, they've actually sort of curbed this, this dramatic um, uh, death rate due to HIV and AIDS and are now living with HIV and AIDS as more of a chronic condition and therefore also dealing more with some of the chronic long-term complications of HIV and AIDS, such as cancer. And that really explains this, the emergence of the cancer epidemic in the wake of the AIDS epidemic. So it's really important to understand that. Um, healthcare in, in Botswana is, um, is, is publicly funded. There is also a private component to healthcare in Botswana but the vast majority of the population rely on the, on the, on the public. I think that the number uh, of doctors, or, or uh, an individual, a patient to a doctor ratio, is uh, approximately 1,800, <coughs> something like that. If you take that in, uh, compare that to the US, in the US we're dealing with a ratio of about 300 to one. So 300 um, patients for one doctor versus 1,800. Um, the, uh, while there's a lot of care that's actually provided within Botswana, um, some of it is not. Some of it is, in fact, outsourced to private hospitals or to neighboring countries, mainly in South Africa. So, for example, immunohistochemistry. So if you have breast cancer and you want to know whether or not it's ERPR positive because you're trying to determine whether tamoxifen plays a role in the hormonal therapy, therapeutic management of, of uh, breast cancer, <coughs> you're sending those slides to South Africa to look at the RPR because immunohistochemistry does not exist uh, uh, in Botswana. Similarly, radiation, actually that one linear accelerator <coughs> I, we mentioned earlier, uh, is housed at the private hospital. But the government pays for every patient, every public patient, to be treated at this, public, uh, at this, public, uh, this private hospital that we need to here. So, so that's the sort of general um, structure um, uh, uh, to, uh, to the healthcare delivery. Uh, there's also a medical school in, in Botswana. However, my, uh, am I right to say that it has yet to graduate a medical student? Is that right? It's almost, almost there. But, it's almost there. And it's, it's ha there's been some logistical challenges and, and, and a, a number of challenges there. But uh, there is a medical school, and in fact, there's a teaching hospital that's being planned for the next, over the next few years to, to be built and open. So again, the infrastructure is there. It's built. So coming back to cancer incidents and the HIV link, this is an important um, graph to, to, to take note of. So we, we said that this is an emerging cancer epidemic within, um, within the setting of HIV AIDS. So these are HIV-related malignancies that you're going to see that are predominant. And what is one of the big ones? Well, in women, cervical cancer, huge, huge, huge problem uh, in the country. Uh, breast cancer is another big problem amongst women in particular. Uh, skin cancer, now, this isn't the, while melanoma exists, squamous cell carcinoma exists, that's not what we're talking about here in skin cancer. Does anyone know what we're talking about when we're saying skin is such a predominant cancer? 
Uh, I think if you think about HIV AIDS. Yeah. Exactly. So the, the, the number of cases of Kaposi's that, that actually exist there, um, we had a case that we recently that did on, a, uh, uh, on, on our cure board. Um, we have so much to learn here about Kaposi's uh, from, from a country like Botswana that is dealing with it on a regular basis. Amongst uh, other cases that in, in males, in particular, head and neck cancers are a big problem. Lymphoma is a big problem. Again, the HIV sort of related uh, cancers or HPV related cancers are, are kind of big problems. Um, this is a picture of the private hospital uh, that houses the linear accelerator. And here's the oncology center that houses uh, that, that center. Um, this is a picture of the waiting room. So, about 60 patients or so get treated every day. You don't have a scheduled time. You just sort of show up and, and you'll be treated uh, when, it, when it, it comes to be your turn. And one thing that you can notice from the waiting room is that the vast majority of patients there are female, right? Um, so <coughs> cervical cancer, a huge issue. Um, and breast cancer, a huge issue. In, in, in some ways, uh, the cancer epidemic has um, has uh, you know, almost disproportionately affected females over males. And you, you notice that when you enter some of the oncology clinics. So, um, this was the, the, the prior picture, this was a private hospital. The big public hospital is Princess Marina Hospital. And it's housed again in that, that capital uh, in, in Manhattan Road. Um, we're actually going to have a wonderful speaker come in on March 28th um, at MGH. Uh, an author, Julie Livingston, who will be talking about the oncology ward uh, at this hospital. So if, if this topic interests you, please, uh, please come to join. Well, while, while this says, well, let me just go back, this says Princess Marina Hospital, the upgrade hospital was officially opened by His Excellency, the President. Um, when it comes to cancer, you can see that this was, this, there's, there's room for further upgrade in, in the oncology uh, in the oncology. Um, this is just a picture of our team with the, with the oncology staff at, um, at the private hospital. This here is, is, is the machine, actually, that they, they have. This is a, an Electa machine. Um, it was, I think it dates to maybe 2001 or so. This is, this is fancy, solid, good equipment, actually. Um, and this is this is sort of the treatment arm uh, for uh, that delivers radiation. So this is a, in fact a linear accelerator. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions that relate to, to, to that. But the equipment again was there. All right, uh, there's no doubt about that. And the infrastructure was there, so it provided a wonderful platform to, to work with. Over there, what you see is through through uh, a window. A CAT scan, um, and this is it built into this oncology uh, ward as well, or into, this is the, the oncology center at the private hospital where the radiation facilities. And that's actually used to take a CAT scan of the, uh, of the patient and then design the treatment based on, on where the tumor is located and its size and everything else. Um, often what you would find is that staging scan, so getting the CAT scan or what, what have you, while you're, you're still staging the patient and figuring out what treatment may be uh, best for them, actually happened at this moment. So there, there, there aren't that many, um, or the availability of good radiology imaging as a sort of a, a regular thing in the staging of patients uh, is, is not quite as available as one would hope. So you would see that actually during the radiation planning stages is when you were actually looking at some the staging imaging. Here is uh, one other uh, important piece of equipment from the world of radiation. So uh, brachytherapy, if folks heard of brachytherapy, this is actually the, the introduction of radiation sources into the body uh, to treat cancer. So as opposed to a linear accelerator that delivers it what's called an external beam, so it's like an x-ray treatment. Um, uh, that's done non-invasively. Brachytherapy uh, is sort of the invasive placement of radiation sources into the body. So you've heard about it from the prostate seed implants or things like that. It is a fundamental uh, treatment for cervical cancer. So in fact, in the world of radiation, there are a few cancers that we can really hang our hat on and say we 
provide the definitive cure <laughs> therapy for, and, and cervical cancer is definitely one of those. Um, so they actually have a, a rather <coughs> fancy uh, nucleotron system. Again, the, the equipment is there. However, the, um, the, 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 the expertise to use it wasn't there. And in fact, we timed our trip uh, uh, shortly after the arrival of the radiation source for this brachytherapy unit in order to help introduce cervical brachytherapy um, to the team, um, uh, to the oncology team in Botswana. And so actually these are uh, some pictures showing uh, the radiation sources uh, that are actually have been implanted into, um, uh, into a patient with cervical cancer. And, uh, High dose rate uh, breakthrough therapy for, for, for this patient. Um, these are just some, some pictures of us working with uh, the team at the clinic uh, in radiation planning and design. So, uh, you know, basically, I hope this, this brief introduction showed you a, you know, uh, you know this the wonderful country of Botswana, the infrastructure in place what's led to the emerging cancer problem there, some of the uh, cancers that actually require uh, focus and we can delight to bring in expertise for and, and do what we call you know, sort of capacity building. The idea, of course, is that we want the oncology uh, folks in Botswana to develop the capacity and the expertise in, in what we're talking about here, not that there's any level of dependency of us coming to provide that care. And so the introduction of cervical brachytherapy is one nice example of that. Um, our trip coming up in May, we're going to be bringing breast and lymphoma experts and, and potentially head and neck experts as well. Uh, they include surgeons, they include medical oncologists and radiation oncologists that are going to be a part of our team. And we'll be working hand in hand with the oncology care providers in Botswana. Um, so that, that's great. These trips have sort of, you know, developed that relationship. Um, but, you know, the, the, the actually the life of this partnership, I have to say, one of the, the successes um, has really been this uh, 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 a kind of a continuous engagement we've developed by developing a, a tumor board. So once a month, we present a case. Uh, it's a case chosen out of a recent um, case in Botswana. It's presented by the physicians taking care of the patient there. And we link them up with Harvard and MGH disease site experts uh, for opinions and guidance and just, just a general discussion as well. So that has been going on once a month over the last year and has been, uh, in my opinion, one of the great ways we've stayed engaged. I mean, it's, many, many of you are, are thinking about different fields. Um, some, of, some of you may be thinking about fields related to oncology. And then it's hard to start imagining, well, how how can you actually do global work while you're, you have your job at Brigham or Mass General or, or, or somewhere else? And uh, in, in the age of, sort of virtual engagement, um, you know, I think that this has actually been a very uh, nice successful model whereby teleconferencing and, and hopefully soon video teleconferencing, we've, re we've remained involved. Um, so what we were going to do is transition to one of those uh, cases, I think, uh, now that we presented recently. Um, and again, these are cases chosen by the care providers in Botswana. And this was a case of a, a patient with, um, uh, uh, that, take, that took place just this past December, and it was a patient with, uh, with breast cancer. Um, and we'll just see here. Yeah. So let me give you a little discussion uh, of, of, for example, the case. And I think that maybe this also highlights some of the, the um, challenges of, of, uh, of oncologic care in, in, uh, in uh, sort of resource limited settings. So this is a patient who's 29 years old, who's a young patient, who presented with a breast mass. And um, uh, so there are a number of, th number of things to, to, to remember. I mean, cancers happen younger than they do here in general. I mean, that's just one general. Uh, um, impression, I think, often related to HIV AIDS, and so maybe that's one of the explaining reasons. Though this patient, uh, this 29-year-old woman, was HIV negative. Um, she presented with a, a, a 
breast mass in March of 2012, so basically a year ago. And um, it, was, it was sort of a painful right breast mass. It was a small lump that was palpated by a nurse. And in April, it led to a breast ul ultrasound. Um, and it showed a solid mass in, in the right breast. Um, and the patient was then referred to gynecology and subsequently referred to surgery. And she presented, by now, it's June 2012, so she remember originally presented it in March. Uh, and so it's about three months later. And not much has happened in that interim. And she's coming now to a new clinic with, again, a painful right breast mass. And now the, the, the pain actually was sort of radiating to her shoulder and her right arm. Um, and on exam, she had a tender right breast mass that measured up to 10 centimeters in size. This is now July of 2012, and she's come to Princess Marina Hospital to the surgical department there. So it's about three or four months after her original complaint of, of symptoms. Um, there's some discoloration overlying the mass. There are, there's, on, the, on the reported exam, there were no axillary lymph nodes that were, were palpated. And she was booked for a fine needle aspiration of this mass. All of this sounds reasonable. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if we, uh, we, have, we have some limited um, uh, pictures here, but I'll, I'll, I'll just leave this up as one of the ultrasound images. So the, this is now July 10th, 2012, and, and they are suspecting tumor. And uh, she is also referred for a core biopsy uh, of the mass. Um, but Ultimately, actually, that was, well, the FNA may have been non-diagnostic, and she didn't quite get to go to for the core biopsy of this mass, but it was felt that her mass may be related to an inflammatory uh, condition secondary to infection. She was actually put on a course of antibiotics at this time. Uh, there was no improvement. It's now the end of July. There was no improvement in her symptoms or in the size of the mass. Um, and uh, that's when this ultrasound was actually taken. So this is now the end of July. This is, this is a large mass on, on an ultrasound. There's no doubt that this is uh, concerning. Um, and, uh, and again, on exam, the exams vary in the, in the documented notes anywhere from five centimeters up to 10 centimeters, as I mentioned. But eventually, there is actually a pathology that is our team, and I think we have that here. So this is another FNA of the right breast, breast lump. Um, and it's reported as having been measured at five centimeters in diameter. And long story short, the impression was that this was proliferative breast disease. Cannot rule out malignancy. So this is, you know, sort of a, a kind of a, what we call a non-specific read, right? I mean, there's clearly um, concern and suspicion, but uh, it's not a definitive diagnosis. Um, so it didn't actually um, lead to anything immediately other than uh, setting up a core biopsy. And it, during this time, the patient continues to have pain um, and hasn't been relieved with the measures taken to date. Uh, so she, on August 9th, actually goes for the excisional biopsy. And the procedure started, but then abandoned after the initial incision. A little unclear to us exactly why it was abandoned, but maybe it was patient you know, requesting that it, it be um, abandoned, that the procedure be abandoned. So she's now actually seen again in September. So this is now September 18th. Um, and uh, another core biopsy is being recommended or offered. Um, at that immediate time, she declined it, but I think about two weeks after that, agreed to go through with the procedure. And so on October 4th, the core biopsy is actually performed. And this is being done at the hospital, Princess Marina Hospital. And yeah, I don't think we have pictures of that. I, I have some here, I have to show them, but basically, that led to this report, um, 
which is definitive this time in its diagnosis of infiltrating, uh, infiltrating ductal carcinoma, which is your, your standard breast, breast uh, uh, histology. So um, and it's felt to be an infiltrating, poorly differentiated ductal carcinoma. This um, report is being read out. So the, the procedure is taken early October. The report is being generated uh, on October 30th, so at the end of October. And that's when she's actually being seen in the Princess Marina Hospital Oncology Unit. And being referred at that time, um, it's felt that she has locally advanced breast cancer, T4 breast cancer, that is involving the skin. In fact, there's uh, ulceration of the, of the skin at this time. And so the feeling was that the best uh, plan was to start with chemotherapy. So uh, I mean, it, you, you know that the tools we have available in cancer are chemo, surgery, or, or radiation. And in this case, it, it made a lot of sense. And we agreed that actually starting with chemotherapy you imagine chemotherapy um, was the right thing to do. Docs Rubison were the backbone to the that chemotherapy regimen. So the drugs were available and, and, and appropriate selection. And she's in fact uh, starting that now on November 2nd. And uh, she, she got through a cycle, uh, a second cycle uh, delivered at the end of November, a third cycle in December, and a fourth cycle was being planned at that time. January. And the idea was that she'd go on to surgical recession after, um, after the course of the United chemotherapy. And this is around, around that time. So it was in December we were discussing this case. It was an ongoing case. And there was discussion about issues of, of uh, what kind of surgery should there be an attempt at breast conservation, um, the, the, the social implications of sort of a mastectomy, um, et cetera. And ultimately, it was felt that she has such advanced, uh, locally advanced disease. This was a young patient where everything was being, uh, uh, should be done to be curative intent. That um, some of the um, availability and expertise in radiation for breast conserving therapy may not be exactly what we would want. Um, and so our recommendation was, in fact, to proceed with a mastectomy following new adjuvant chemotherapy as a conservative um, uh, 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 approach. Um, so I mean, sort of oncologically as safe as possible approach for this. And that's actually probably exactly what we would be doing here as well. And then the discussion afterwards, of, which hasn't happened yet, but, uh, the, the role of radiation as well after. So this case, I think, um, and, and you know, so uh, chose it. I mean, we, we've obviously discussed a number of cases, but it highlights a common disease, one that we see regularly here. And I think it also highlights some of the issues that that um, that arise in resource limited settings uh, in the delivery of complex oncologic care. So one is the interval between her initial presentation in March to actually starting treatment in November. So that's an interval of about eight months. And, and clearly, this cancer had progressed in that, in that time period. There can be a number of barriers, delays to diagnosis. Um, there are incredible constraints on a variety of aspects of uh, oncologic care delivery. Uh, pathology is a major limiting factor. The, the human capital involved that, that's required for 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 um, definitive diagnoses and turnaround times of pathology, etc. I think I already mentioned the avail the lack of the availability, for example, of immunohistochemistry. Um, yeah, I mean, cancer is, as Nina highlighted in one of one of her slides, that it, it, there's so many little components, and you're so dependent on that one happening in the right order and, and relying on the validity of the data that you're being given, et cetera. And I think that this case highlights a, a, few, a few of those, those issues. Um, you know, Nina, did you have sort of particular points that you would like us to discuss or um, any? any? I, I wanted to ask the uh, physicians from Botswana uh, what if you guys had anything to add. Is this something that sort of happens commonly, sort of a common type of case you might see there? Or? Um, I just had one thing that I wanted to add here. Um, 
and that has to do with the weakness in the referral process <coughs> in this type of setting, resource limited setting. I'm just using this one as an example. Um, based on my experience of working there, it seems like the um, well, various programs such as you know your HIV program, your TV program, have um, weaknesses in the way that um, you know patients are referred. Um, so just looking at this particular case, I mean, this lady had a diagnosis, well, not a diagnosis, but a mass that was detected on ultrasound in um, April of 2012. And we think that, you know, based on that um, result, she should have then been referred to, you know, a specialist at a tertiary level. Um, but that did not happen. So I think um, weaknesses in the referral systems um, has definitely played a, you know, a role in delaying the diagnosis being made for this patient and then treatment being initiated. So that's the only thing that I have to mm -hmm. probably add to that. Yeah, and this is actually a huge issue, which is um, sort of multidisciplinary care delivery. I mean, we're, 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 you're all fortunate, as I was, to, to, to work in hospitals that are tertiary care centers walk down the hallway and you have the best radiologist to read your scan and the pathologist, you can 100% rely on that read and that read is done within a week of a, a, a biopsy or a surgery. All of these things we take for granted and, and a lot of the communication that happens is a complex care delivery we in a sense take for granted because it's just there, it happens. We're fortunate to be surrounded by an organ system. That doesn't necessarily happen everywhere. Not, not only in Botswana or uh, in Africa, here in the U.S., <laughs> it, 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 you know. And so the, the key is communication, I think, which is what you're highlighting. And one of the efforts of our tumor board, which basically about 30 to 50 care, uh, oncology-related care providers attend our uh, tumor boards from the Botswana side. And this is one of those few times that they've told us that they're actually all in the room together. The surgeon's there, the pathologist's there, the, the oncologist is there, uh, the house officers are there, everybody's kind of there. And these process issues, you know, sort of systems issues, are actually being addressed. Um, just because by nature of being in the same room, actually addressing a case that highlights some potential deficiencies and start brainstorming about ways to make it better. So, I mean, some things that have been raised in our tumor boards have been the idea of, um, you know, that, that, that the clinicians, the referring clinicians, actually flag a case that they're worried about, that they need a quicker read on, or, or um, that there's more, you know, communication, let's say, just taking pathology as an example, with pathology. Um, so these are, these are some things that can be improved. I mean, that, that, that's the key, right, is identifying actionable things that can indeed potentially be improved. Um, and again, that, that this improvement really be born out of those on the ground there, you know, and, uh, and, and understanding the environment and the challenges. I'll tell you, we, we, I visited the National Health Laboratory in, uh, in, in, uh, in the capital. And I was just taking, there are three pathologists, they're completely overworked. Um, there were vats and vats and vats of specimens that needed to be processed that were coming from all over the, you know, the, the country. Um, and you could just, you could, you could palpate their anxiety level and their over, you know, just sense of being stressed and work, overworked. And it was there, you know, um, and you could understand this isn't so easy. I mean, I'll give another example as well. Um, that this is an extreme example, and you, should, you surely shouldn't take this as any regular occurrence, but it was told to us by one of the oncologists while we were there. It was about another breast cancer patient. And again, I think it highlights um, how dependent one is on, on these things. Um, it was told to us by, it was a patient of one of the oncologists there, who um, was a, a, a young lady who um, was diagnosed with breast cancer and went through um, a mastectomy, adjuvant chemotherapy, and adjuvant and one of the big risks of all those treatments put together is lymphedema, right, of the upper extremity. And the, the, the woman developed pretty bad lymphedema. She had, I think, three kids or so, and, and her, um, 
her uh, uh, husband left her because of this disfigurement from, from, the, from the treatment. And so now she's you know, a single mother of three children. And, the, the, and you know, by all counts, you know, the treatment she'd gotten was correct. Right? Um, the sequencing, et cetera. But now it came to that issue that I raised earlier of ERPR status and is, does tamoxifen actually play a role in her continued management? And so the slides were sent to South Africa and all the slides were sent and the report came back there was no cancer. There was never any cancer. Um, and you can imagine um, that moment uh, the patient learning that information, you know, the oncologist having to give that information. Um, this is the, by no means a regular occurrence. I'm just, it was an extreme example that was shared with us. But I think it, again, highlights how dependent you are with your colleagues and how opening communication streams and, and things like that goes a long, long, a long way. Um, and it also highlights how complex delivery of you know, good oncologic care actually is. So I, I hope that <clears throat> highlights a couple of those issues. But did folks have questions about the case? Or? Um, first, like, congratulations on the program. It seems like a very interesting initiative. I had some questions about um, the maintenance and sustainability of the program in terms of the fact that they just got a radi um, equipment for radiation. Um, <coughs> and I've assumed that there's no physicians trained in radiation oncology in Botswana. Are you developing a training program there for physicists, therapists? positions. I'm just curious how that's So, so it's a great question. R radiation is so complex. I mean, uh, the physician, the radiation oncology, one small component, actually, it's a good delivery of radiation care. You are highly dependent on therapists, physicists, asymmetrists, engineers, etc., to actually make a, 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 a place function. Um, and and this, this goes back to the human capital issue. The, the, the two main clinical oncologists in the country, and they're, they're, there's more now coming in, but a year ago, there were only two. Um, they were trained in the UK model, clinical oncology, meaning they could give chemotherapy and radiation. And they were both the attending level sort of physicians. They both worked at the private hospital at the time, where the radiation unit was, and they were both trained in Zimbabwe. Okay, and they were all um, uh, foreign trained in the UK, uh, elsewhere. And they had left Zimbabwe for reasons we uh, spoke about earlier. And, and, and they, they, were, they, they, at that time, and still today, are the two main oncologists. Um, there was also a medical oncologist coming from China on, on the equivalent of um, sort of Doctors Without Borders kind of program that, that China has with uh, some African nations. Um, but that physician didn't speak English. And so the communication barrier was extraordinary. Okay. Um, the vast majority of oncologic care delivery was provided by three house officers who were primarily devoted to the oncology work, trained obviously internal medicine based. And they were by far and away the folks taking care of most of the chemotherapeutic management that was happening at Princess Marina Hospital, et cetera. So this is sort of a broader answer to your question, but the point is, yes, there were actually trained radiation oncologists, two, these two clinical oncologists that I mentioned. Um, but now let's think about how brownouts in electricity were at that time. They're a lot better now. But, uh, uh, just even a year ago, were not that uncommon in Botswana. A certain degree of uh, dependency was, exists between Botswana and South Africa for electricity. Now, if South Africa decides, well, no, we got to serve over here in South Africa, you know, a little more, maybe actually that leads to, so what happens then? Well, yeah, you have generated, but soon enough your radiation machine isn't running. And so you actually plan for a lot more downtime than you would be accustomed to here. Machines are maintained by the companies that brought them in. So while we were there, an Electa rep <laughs> was there kind of doing uh, you know, some level of quality assurance on the machine. Um, the level, there's one physicist there, uh, one dosimetrist there, so they were involved in the design of the actual treatments uh, along with the physician. Um, it is very common, so let, let's talk about radiation oncology. What we use are different forms of ways of delivering radiation. There's a linear accelerator that you saw, there's the sticking radiation sources into, um, into, into the body. 
you get to the cancer. Um, when we design external beam radiation, we want to shape the fields, right? We want to shape the fields to treat the cancer and avoid the normal tissue, um, to avoid toxicity. Well, what does that mean? Well, practically, there's a lot of fancy ways to do it nowadays, but what we do is block things out. So if you want to treat the heart, okay, and you want to avoid treating as much lung around the heart as possible, well, you do blocks, what are called blocks, right? When you uh, made of lead or whatever, um, they, they actually sort of shape the, 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 the beam that's coming out of the machine to be conformal to the area that you want to treat and avoid, the areas you want to avoid. That is a, that happens in 98% of the treatments we deliver here. But the use of blocking and shaping of fields is used in 10% or less of the cases. So these are what we call open fields. They are, they're the, it's a box, okay? It's a square, rectangular field. And you got a cancer down here, well, it's a box down here. You got a cancer up here in the head and neck, it's a box right here. And now what does that lead to? Um, that leads to a lot more toxicity from the treatment. And um, the very interesting thing, uh, well, the, the reality in resource limited settings, is the lack of follow up care. So m there are no follow up clinics. Very few of these patients were actually seen in follow up by the oncologist treatment. So you would go through your chemotherapy, your radiation, etc., and um, and, and you, know, you might be treated with big open fields, and there may be some significant toxicities that develop from that, but you weren't actually regularly being managed. So the physicians actually weren't getting, or the oncology care providers weren't necessarily always getting the feedback. A, did the treatment they delivered work? Did it, did it cure the cancer? Did it provide relief or, or whatever? <laughs> but they also, very importantly, didn't get the feedback on what problems did I cause in these patients from the treatment? And that sort of feedback actually wasn't, wasn't um, you know, regularly there. So again, very complex though. Very complex. It's a big country as you saw, um, and not everybody lives in, in, so the main city where the radiation unit is, is a population of about 200,000. But the, the country is two million. So folks are traveling often a great distance in order to get their oncology care. And then they're going to go back home after they're finished. And so the follow-up isn't there. The mechanism isn't there. And then there's a whole bunch of other Well, what if you travel a couple hundred miles or more or what have you for your treatment? Where do you stay, right? And so, uh, you know, for, you know, radiation usually takes weeks and weeks of treatment, right? So where do you actually stay? One of, one of the, the places that we've gotten to know well is the, the Cancer Association of Botswana, a nonprofit which basically provides interim housing for a good number of the, uh, the patients who are receiving radiation care and have to be in the capital for weeks at a time. So but I'm just trying to highlight some of those issues that you actually start grappling with and how complicated it can be uh, to, to do this. Now, we're also dealing with a country that has, in, in Botswana, a, a good infrastructure, right? Uh, I mean, they have a radiation machine. They have, you know, uh, um, a certain amount of resources that are requisite. Now, there are other countries, if we're sticking to the continent of Africa, and colleagues of ours, some folks in the room here work very closely with um, uh, partners in health and the efforts in Rwanda and bringing oncology care to Rwanda. Well, that's actually even t tougher in some ways because the, the infrastructure level isn't quite what it is in Botswana. So for example, Rwanda, if we go back to the, ma the map that, that Nina showed earlier, has zero radiation <laughs> machines. So how do you bring ra radiation there? Um, you know, radiation, one of the, the, the three curative and important treatments for, for cancer care, how do you bring that there? And so the group in, in Rwanda is starting, starting to tackle that issue. Um, so this is a long answer to your question, but uh, basically um, there are physicians there, but the human capital needed to expand this and develop the expertise and build the capacity to, for growth is, is um, still much needed. Um, sort of a related question. Um, you mentioned that there are some of the political or other barriers to bringing in radiation therapy in certain countries. Um, 
Um, so, uh, well, let, let's actually start with the, the International Atomic Energy Commission um, recommends that there be one linear accelerator for every 250 to 500,000 in the population. So in the country of Botswana, that means a minimum of four linear accelerators. They, they, they have one, right? Um, and then obviously a number of countries have, have none. So that, that's kind of a, a, if you had a goal, I mean, I guess that would be roughly a goal. Um, I think the, you know, I don't know if there's so much, I mean, there are definitely political barriers to, to a lot of uh, the, this work. But it, it's, um, you know, you need to develop the expertise. You need to have the local on the ground expertise to actually deliver coordinated care. To, to, you have to have a certain level of, of funding available to bring in and build a, uh, an ecology center or bring in a radiation machine. So you need the political willpower to actually make that happen and to feed its growth. Um, I'm not sure what sort of other political barriers you you were hinting at anything. Um, well, I mean, like for example, in Rwanda, what are some of the barriers that you see Yeah, I mean, I think really it is the building of the human capital to 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 deliver a very complex treatment, and it goes beyond just the physician. And I think it's one thing for our teams to go and visit, but you know, unless we're living there for <coughs> periods of time, it has to be something. It has to be trained folks who are committed to to delivering the care there and staying there. Right. So there is also an exodus of street talent, um, and and so if we go just to the medical school level, right? I mean, if we had to train these folks somewhere. One. And that's not just, uh, you know, to be clear, it's not just the physician. It's delivered good care. It's much more complicated. And these other folks, the engineers and the therapists and this and that, are, are equally as, as important. Um, so you got to, they have to be trained somewhere. Now, if, if you don't have that training program in the country, they have to be trained somewhere else. And then they got to come back. And, and then, you know, and you got to build that incentive to, to do all of you. And so, um, you know, Botswana has a, a, a medical school that uh, it has its own challenges and political challenges, but it's, it's there. It's building a, a teaching hospital. It's going to, with that growth, provide specialty-oriented training. Okay. Um, and then maybe you can address some of the issues. I mean, you, you, you left Botswana for, to train in, in Australia. Mm. Right? At the time, there was no medical school. Um, this was in the early 2000s. Um, so at that stage, the government of Botswana, which was sponsoring students who were interested in doing medicine to, to go for training, they were sending students outside of the country. Um, South Africa was one country that we were sent to in, in Africa, and then the other countries were outside of Africa, Australia being one of them. But now, obviously, that's changed with the setting up of the medical student. It was a I mean, medical school, which was set up in 2009. And we're expecting the first graduates to come through. I think it's, it's this year that the first lot of graduates will, will come through. Um, so I guess the government of Botswana definitely, um, I suppose when, you, when you're talking about political will, there is political will there um, from the government of Botswana to try and build capacity, human resource capacity for the health system. Um, and one way that you know they've they've decided to do that is to establish a medical school, um, and you know there's also other efforts that are being taken to try and build capacity for the health system, to try and improve things. And so definitely, and, and one is a little behind you. There's yeah. years of investment in this, um, and and attracting and retaining talent. Uh, and getting back to your, your question from earlier, I mean, some other ways that one can help in the interim is, for example, on the therapy side of things, or the physics side of things, where at least our effort is trying to develop distance learning. So, in fact, um, ongoing education, right? uh, things that can, can be done through, through, uh, you know, through, uh, through the internet and through distance learning sort of methods. So, there, there clearly is that, but the training is really important. And the training, not just in the professional, but also in the, the technical, you know, um, and then and then retain, retain folks. And 
the investment in capital. I mean, there's, there's definitely money that's required. Um, and, and, you know, and then just the complex care of coordinated healthcare delivery, which is, um, which again, for a lot of us, one of them is taking for granted. Um, so, to follow up on that, um, there are probably risks associated with introducing a new technology or a new modality of treatment in um, a, a new environment. And um, with the sorts of elements that you just described in terms of capital, in terms of training, um, is there a way to define whether a country is ready um, to receive a new technology or a new um, treatment modality? And what are the risks associated with sort of not being at that stage? I, I think I think that's actually a very important question, um, <clears throat> and, and I don't think I, I I don't think I have the answer to it. Other than um, to say that you're right. I mean, if you're you're coming in and, and just bringing radiation to, 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 to a country that's never had it, to a community that's never had it, to it you do expose yourself to a lot of potential risks, um, the potential for misuse of that treatment or you know, and it can lead to dangerous consequences. So I think you have to be very cognizant of that potential. Um, you have to, if you're engaging in developing a collaboration and partnership, you have to do it for the long term. Uh, this is one that requires repeat visits and ongoing discourse, you know, um, and that you're helping, being part of helping tackle the challenges as, as they arise daily. You know. um, in, I mean, I can talk on the point of the, the delivery of brachytherapy, to, you know, cervical brachytherapy into Botswana in the sense that, in fact, they had received a, um, a brachytherapy unit. They wanted to use this. They wanted to put because they knew it could deliver potentially curative therapy to a good number of their patients. They just hadn't been trained. Or maybe they had been trained 15 years ago and never, you know, hadn't seen it since. Uh, and so that was the perfect time to be partner and, and really help introduce that and develop the expertise. And I can tell you that there it wasn't without its challenges. Um, that uh, doing this kind of care is complicated, and you know maybe the first few times it's not perfect, but at least you're making the investment of making it happen. And the long-term investment of, of delivering this is is going to far. Outweigh the, the, the potential short-term challenges. So I, I think there the timing was right, the investment was right. We had a sustainable and longer longer term, so along the two relationship. So it felt it felt like we were doing the right thing. But I think you, you ask a very important question. You know, um, you can't just you can't just sort of throw in a fancy machine and tool and say, hey, all right, we you know, it's, it, it, that has a lot of data. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, we'll be around, Dr. Sapti will be around if you guys want to come, up, come up and ask any more questions. I just wanted to thank uh, you all for coming here tonight. And please uh, sign in and leave your emails if you're interested in this kind of stuff. We'll send you emails about ways to get involved. Um, so thank you for coming and thank you. For